everybody to this uh, first uh, uh, workshop uh, uh, organized by the In Italian Institute of Culture uh, of Tel Aviv. Uh, the workshop uh, uh, is entitled uh, Glaciers and Arid Zones, the Climate Change Impact, and uh, is uh, uh, part of the, uh, uh, the activities of the Institute. Uh, Connected to the um, um, exhibition of mount on mountains and, and glaciers, uh, um, the exhibition that is called "So Harsh, So Fragile: Exploring the Relationships Among Man, Mountain, and Dry Land." Uh, we have the the director of the Institute of uh, um, Culture in a few minutes. Uh, she. Uh, had some uh, troubles in connecti connecting, so she is coming here. But uh, in the meanwhile, let me introduce uh, the speakers. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, speech will be given by um, uh, Professor Guglielmina Diolaiuti and Dr. Davide Fugasta from the Department of Environmental Science and Politics of the University of Milan. Uh, they are. Uh, um, they are well-known uh, uh, glaciologists. Uh, we probably, uh, you probably know that the, the glaciological uh, uh, community in Italy is very strong and uh, had done a lot of uh, work even in the past. So they will talk uh, uh, about uh, our glaciers, the water reservoirs of our planet, forecasts on the impact of the retreat of glaciers in Europe and on the high Asian mountain ranges. That's very interesting for me that I, in my uh, past times, I've done uh, works on uh, glacier retreats, uh, either in, in Svalbard and uh, and also on the on the um, Altai Mountains. So I'm I'm uh, eager to uh, listen from them, to hear from them. The second talk, uh, passing from uh, glaciers uh, uh, to the desert, uh, will be given by uh, Dr. Pedro Berliner of the Ben Gurion University of the Negev, uh, Steboker Campus, an expert on uh, on uh, desert and uh, desert technologies. Um, I will say that uh, it seems uh, strange to join uh, desert uh, studies with uh, glacial studies, but it's not so, uh, completely true because uh, water dynamics are so important either in the desert and in uh, in uh, high mountain environments uh, in uh, 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 glaciers and around glaciers. Uh, uh, water is uh, available, uh, uh, seems to be available in, uh, in, uh, in high mountains, but it actually it's available only for a fraction of time because for the rest is uh, frozen uh, and the evaporation is uh, very strong and uh, very rapid. So uh, soils in, uh, in mountain environments are exposed to dryness, uh, not as the same level of uh, um, deserts, but still it's uh, a very important uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, the third, in the third communication, we'll pass from um, from uh, from uh, uh, the physical environment, uh, from glaciers and from deserts, uh, to the effects of uh, um, uh, glacier retreats, uh, uh, climate change impact, uh, desertification on uh, men. Anthropocentric or biocentric uh, is the title of the communication that will be given by. Uh, Dr. Uh, Paola Gigliotti. Uh, uh, Paola has a long uh, history of uh, uh, commitment uh, on uh, human uh, uh, life in the mountains, uh, in harsh environments, uh, also in sport activities, but not only. So uh, it's really interesting to connect what is happening to the environment uh, to what's uh, happening uh, to the human. Uh, uh, communities living in uh, mountain uh, mountain regions and uh, regions exposed to uh, uh, in special mode to climate change. Uh, now we we uh, we begin with the first uh, with the first um, uh, communication and uh, when the the director will be available, she will give a a, a greeting uh, to us. So please. Uh, um, um, Guglielmina and Davide, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. 
I'm going to share the screen. Okay. Okay. I hope uh, you can see my screen. Then uh, let's start. Uh, um, I will manage the first part of uh, this communication. And the second part uh, will be done uh, by my colleague, uh, Davide Fugazza. It's really a pleasure for us to, to be part uh, of this uh, conference, of this webinar, even if uh, remotely. Uh, in fact, uh, we have uh, the opportunity to share with you the results uh, of uh, our most recent research in the field uh, of uh, climate change and uh, its uh, impacts uh, on cryosphere and uh, on the landscape. Our uh, research group uh, at the University of Milan in Italy is involved in studying the impacts of uh, climate change, mainly on the cryosphere, that is to say on snow, on ice, on glacier ice and on permafrost. This is the reason we focus our attention uh, on mountain, uh, on the main mountain area of the planet, where glaciers and perennial snow are located. In addition, uh, we also study the landscape uh, and environmental variations caused by climate change in different areas of the planet, uh, from the Alps, uh, the Andes, Antarctica, the Himalayas and the Karakoram. Uh, to, to do this, uh, we use different methods and techniques uh, ranging from remote sensing to physically based uh, models uh, to describe uh, ice melting and glacier dynamics, uh, from geomorphology to glacial ecology. We, uh, we are part uh, of several national and international projects aimed at describing recent climate changes and uh, at quantifying the impacts of uh, climate change on the environment. We also uh, participated uh, in projects uh, aimed at illustrating climate change to the public, to citizens and students, in order to promote uh, a more conscious use of resources and uh, virtuous behaviors for uh, an actual reduction of uh, greenhouse gases uh, emission. I would like to begin this communication by illustrating our research in the Alps, where the impacts of climate change are stronger and more evident. And then we will continue by showing you our research in arid areas of the planet, in Asia and in the Middle East and Davide will continue this part. In these uh, areas, in these far areas of the planet, uh, meltwater plays a uh, non-negligible role as drinkable water, as water to be used for cropping and uh, to support uh, hydropower production. And then uh, in such remote areas, our research are really important to um, to know present and future availability of uh, uh, glacier meltwater. Then uh, let's start uh, from the Italian Alps. Climate change is causing uh, a, a huge uh, surface and volume reduction of glaciers uh, in the world and in the Alps. Italian glaciers uh, have experienced uh, an, an area reduction of about 30% in the last 50 years. Uh, this data derived from the National Glacier Inventory, we developed and published recently. Uh, you can download the, the whole uh, Italian Glacier Inventory uh, at this uh, link. Uh, is a, a, a digital book in both uh, English and Italian language. In this slide, I have also reported uh, 
four pictures, uh, four images of uh, Forni Glacier. Forni Glacier is one uh, of the widest, uh, of the biggest uh, uh, glacier in the Italian Alps. In these uh, pictures, you can see Forni Glacier from the end of the 19th century up uh, today. The retreat uh, of the glacier tongue is strong, is really strong. Please consider that uh, this glacier has shrunk by about two kilometers in length over the last 150 years. In the same period, many other elements of the alpine ecosystem have changed due to the increase in air temperature. Please consider that air temperature increased of about one Celsius degree and half during the last uh, century. Nevertheless, only glaciers have manifested the effects of climate change so clearly and inequivocally. In fact, uh, the extinction of uh, an, an animal of plant is not understandable by everyone. One must be a botanist or a zoologist to understand uh, that uh, uh, a, an element uh, of fauna or flora is suffering climate change. Instead, a, um, a retreat of the glacier tongue of about two kilometers is evident to everyone and no specialized studies are needed to, to understand. You need only to compare some photographs. The project conceived and developed by Fabiano Ventura and called on the trails of glaciers is based on this ability of glaciers to illustrate the impacts of climate change. And my research group took part to this project accompanying uh, Fabiano Ventura during uh, his expeditions uh, and carrying out a scientific research uh, on the glaciers uh, uh, he photographed. The strong reduction of glaciers uh, highlighted by the photographic comparisons prepared by Fabiano Ventura allowed many people to understand the real impact of uh, climate change on glaciers on landscape and on water resources. The project and the exhibitions of uh, photographic operations are then uh, one effective tool to increase citizen awareness of climate change and to increase the importance of changing our lifestyle to reduce our impact on the atmosphere and on climate. Please consider that glaciers are fragile elements of the environment. Ice ruptures, collapses uh, are more and more frequent uh, in the Alps uh, and uh, in mountain areas as well. And then uh, risk scenarios uh, are necessary for high mountain visitors. Uh, and uh, it's also important uh, to survey continuously glaciers uh, to understand, to understand uh, um, magnitude and rates of uh, their changes, uh, of their variations. Moreover, also ephemeral lakes develop at the surface of glacier. Endoglacial water pockets, cavities filled with meltwater that can constitute the um, risk uh, for, uh, for visitors and uh, for people. And then uh, again, therefore, it's important uh, to develop risk scenarios uh, and uh, to study and to, uh, to survey continuously glaciers. To contribute to know and understand uh, glaciers uh, and all the environmental changes uh, depending on glacier variations, my research team uh, is producing glacier inventory and several studies on surface and volume glacier changes. 
Uh, in this uh, example, uh, I report uh, the data obtained with remote sensing analysis for uh, a wide representative uh, protected area of Italy, the Stelvio National Park. We studied all the glaciers located in this protected area during the last 50 years and uh, we evaluated a surface area decrease of the glaciers in the Stelvio National Park equal to 40%, to more than the 40%. So uh, the glaciers located in this park uh, have lost about 40% of the area during the last uh, 50 years. Moreover, the reduction is not linear, is accelerating over time with retreating rates in recent years that are double and in some cases threefold compared to the, to the past ones. So not only the glaciers are decreasing, but, but the reduction rate is accelerating. Moreover, it's also important to underline that uh, um, not only glaciers uh, as, uh, are shrinking intensely, but internal rocky areas are increasing in number and uh, in extension. The rock windows uh, inside the glacier, uh, which are known as uh, outcropping rocks, uh, are dark and they absorb uh, uh, more efficiently solar radiation. It up uh, emitting long wave radiation and thus accelerating uh, the melting of the surrounding ice. And this causes uh, an increase, uh, an increasing uh, rapid glacier retreat. Our analysis not only permitted uh, to quantify the surface area reduction, but also the water release that is to say the volume of water lost by the glaciers over time. These are not real losses as this water feeds glacial streams and rivers. This water supports agriculture, cropping, and is very important for, for hydropower plants. Just to have an idea of the, the quantity of water uh, released by glacier for the Stelvio National Park uh, during 26 uh, uh, years, uh, glacier have lost about uh, 666 million of uh, cube meters of ice. That is to say, 702 billion liters of water. So, uh, a big quantity of, uh, of water. Knowing how much water is released from glaciers, we can also assess current and future impacts of glacier melt on hydroelectric power production. We performed a pilot study in Italy and we found that probably climate change in Italy on the next decades could reduce up to 20% the water available for hydropower. More precisely, to assess uh, the impact uh, of uh, glacier ice melt on hydropower, we divided uh, a larger representative alpine area into uh, two subsectors. One subsector, R1 in the figure, um, was without uh, glaciers, and uh, the other one, R2 in the figures, um, was characterized by both uh, hydropower plants, the yellow dots, and glaciers, the light blue uh, uh, areas. For both uh, sectors, we calculated uh, the water budgets, that is to say the amount of water available um, in, a, in a wide period from 1981 to uh, 2007 that feed the power plants deriving from rain, snow melt, and glacier ice melt. It emerged that in the sector with glaciers, glaciers provided up to 20% of the water used for hydropower, and then in the next future, 
when Glasser will be not uh, present, we could therefore have uh, up to 20% less water for energy production with the non negligible economic impacts. A similar study uh, is probably important and required in several areas of the planet where glaciers are present, hydropower depends largely on glacier ice melt, and uh, then uh, our study can be useful in these areas. For example, we are just starting a cooperation with the Pakistan government to assess uh, climate change impacts on Pakistan glaciers, on mountain areas, and on hydropower production as well by applying a similar approach. Last but not least, we are also uh, conducting uh, um, analysis and studies on the anthropogenic impact on the environment, uh, and in particular using glaciers as uh, uh, weaknesses of the anthropogenic impact uh, on the environment. In fact, we also uh, sample snow ice and debris uh, and analyzing such materials, uh, we have found uh, traditional and emerging uh, pollutants uh, into glacier ice uh, and the, and the derived uh, meltwater. We also found microplastic. We were the first uh, to found uh, microplastic uh, on an alpine glacier. And it's very important uh, to, to look for these uh, pollutants. Uh, in fact, uh, when uh, ice melts, they enter in the food chain, so it's very important to have an idea of quantity and uh, type of these uh, pollutants. These researchers are parallel and complementary uh, to the one on climate change. In fact, the increasing intense uh, melting of glaciers leads to the release into the environment of uh, toxic uh, chemicals stored uh, by glaciers in the past, for example, DDT. And then in the future, there are for uh, larger quantities uh, of these uh, um, pollutants can uh, return, can be again in circulation due to global warming and to the increasing melt of glaciers. To uh, complete uh, our knowledge uh, on this topic, we also, in cooperation with uh, the ecologists uh, of our university, analyze uh, also bacteria present at the glacier surface. And the most important result uh, is that uh, many of these bacteria have a very important role uh, in, contribu in contributing uh, to the demolition of pollutants, uh, by accelerating this process. And then uh, this bacteria can be important in reducing uh, uh, pollutants uh, into glacier. So it, it's a very important result. Now, the space is for my colleague Davide Fugazza, who will illustrate you our extra alpine research, in particular in Asia and the Middle East. So, Davide, it's your time. Thank you very much. I will share my screen as well. Can you see it? Okay. So, um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit uh, more about myself first. Um, I am a postdoctoral scientist at the Department of Environmental Science and Policy of the University of Milan. And the focus of my research is the use of remote sensing to study the cryosphere, so glaciers and snow. And by remote sensing, I mean that I use uh, both satellite data and other things like drones. So with the satellite data, the advantage is that we can cover uh, very large areas uh, at a glance, but uh, we are limited in the amount of detail that we can observe. Whereas with drones, we can focus on small areas like individual glaciers, but we have an extremely high level of detail. 
Now, there are a number of things that we can do using remote sensing to study glaciers and snow cover. Uh, one of the uh, most basic, at least theoretically, because it's actually uh, a lot more difficult than we would like, is the creation of glacier inventories. And uh, as Gunnelina already told you, we are uh, we have specialized in the production of, of inventories of glaciers in different parts of the world. But we can also observe other things like the darkening of glaciers and the changes in volume. So not just with, with inventories, we look at the changes in area, but we can also see the changes in volume. And then we can look at snow cover and also estimate how much meltwater is produced by glaciers and snow cover when they melt. Um, speaking of glacier inventories, um, Guglielmina already told you about our uh, inventory of Italian glaciers, which we produced in 2015 and which is available as a book and also freely downloadable online. Um, just uh, to visualize uh, Italian glaciers, so we have more than 900 in, in Italy and they cover more than uh, nearly 370 square kilometers. We always like to make this comparison with lakes. So we like to say that uh, Italian glaciers cover an area which is about the same size as Lake Garden, but at the same time, the amount of area that was lost since the 1960s is a third of this, and it's about the size of Lake Como. So this gives you an idea of how much uh, glaciers have retreated really over time in the Italian Alps. Um, in 2020, we created another inventory of uh, all European glaciers, uh, pardon, uh, yes, Euro um, Alpine glaciers, so not just in Italy, but in the rest of the European Alps as well. And uh, this was part of an international effort, so with colleagues from Switzerland, France, Austria, and Germany to produce an inventory of glaciers using common methodology um, by employing satellite data. And this inventory is also available online. Uh, so both the inventory itself and also the article that describes it are freely available for you to look at. Um, so with this inventory, as I said, we um, used a common methodology, which was a semi-automatic methodology which by uh, taking advantage from the different bands of the satellite data uh, is able to automatically distinguish ice and snow from the surrounding terrain. But then we still have to apply a number of manual corrections, uh, including dividing the glaciers between their the separate water catchments um, and also correcting some things like uh, permanent snow fields, uh, shadow areas, but the most important correction is for uh, the debris cover parts of glaciers. And this uh, brings me into the introduction of the topic of debris cover. So um, you can see these pictures are from um, glaciers that I visited last summer as part of the expedition on the trails of glaciers in the European Alps. Uh, so these are all glaciers from Italy, Switzerland and Austria. And we are used to thinking of glaciers as white, really. But as you can see in these pictures, they are often not really white. So what we have is uh, things like debris coming from the surrounding rock walls, but also dust, which is transported through the atmosphere from far away, like deserts, which is the topic of today's talk as well. And also black carbon coming from um, wood fires, but also from anthropogenic emissions, so from the combustion of diesel engines. And all these things accumulate on glaciers and they darken the surface. And when this happens, uh, the ability of the glacier to reflect solar radiation is reduced. And this ability, which is called albedo. And so when the albedo decreases, then more solar radiation is absorbed and then the glacier eventually melts faster. So, we did a study on the glaciers of the Ofnes Cerudale group in the Italian Alps using satellite data from NASA from the 80s to the present days. 
And we observed that for almost all the glaciers that we studied, there was a significant decrease in this ability to reflect solar radiation, which in some cases um, were, was almost cut in half. And, and so this means that these glaciers then are more fragile and, and are left uh, uh, to, to witness the impacts of climate change. Um, one thing that we can do instead using drones is to look at the volume changes of the glaciers. So, as I said, not just the changes in area, but also the changes in the vertical component. So, how much thickness of ice is lost over time. And we can do that over uh, very small time windows. So, for instance, in this study, we look at the changes of Forney Glacier uh, over two years. And uh, this is the, the graph on the right, and you can see uh, the red areas is where the glacier lost uh, more than 20 meters of ice over two years. So you can imagine this is about a five, four store building of ice, which is completely gone over the course of two years. Another thing that we can look at using remote sensing is the changes in snow cover. We did this study last year looking at the length of the snow cover season over the Alps from satellite data. And we saw that for the areas at high elevation, so above 3,000 meters, we have a significant reduction in the length of the snow cover season. So we have more than 17 days each 10 years um, in, of reduction of the length of the snow cover season. And this is because high elevation areas are the ones that are most subject to the effects of climate change and where temperatures tend to increase the most. And, and then I would also like to, to finally have a look at the research that uh, the glaciology group of the University of Milan, so that we do in, in arid areas. So Guglielmina told you about the importance of glaciers in the Alps. So for us, glaciers are definitely important for tourism and also for the production of hydroelectric power. In, in Western Valtellina, if you think about glaciers and snow cover combined, they account for more than 50% of hydropower production in some places. But there are places where glacier and snow cover melt are even more important. Uh, we're thinking about the Central Karkor National Park, which is one of the main focuses of our recent research. And you can see in the picture on the left, uh, these are people that are taking ice cubes from the glacier and they are using that because it's their only source of water for drinking and also for other civil uses. And another area uh, which, which we studied in detail is in Eastern Kazakhstan. And these are places that receive very little precipitation every year. Um, except in a very short period of time uh, in spring when meltwater from glaciers and snow is released over a very short time. And uh, all this water is obviously important for civil use and especially for hydropower production there, but it can also cause problems because it's so much that it causes floods, which can damage the infrastructure and also cause loss of lives. And this is an overview of the places where we conduct our research in, in arid areas. And also, aside from Eastern Kazakhstan and the Central Karakoram National Park in Pakistan, we have also done some research in Turkey and particularly on Mount Ararat. In this area, we created another inventory of all glaciers, both all Turkish glaciers and particularly focusing on the Ararat glacier, which we observed uh, decreased its area about by about 30% between 1990 and 2016. So this is basically a, a similar percentage to what we observed in Italy. But the, the percentage of decreasing area that we saw in Italy was over more than 50 years, whereas this is in about half the time. So you can see that in these places, climate change is having an even greater effect on glaciers. In Eastern Kazakhstan, um, in the study that we did, we tried to estimate the exact timing of these peak snow cover events. And 
the uh, amount of melt of melt water that is released from snow cover and we observed that this amount actually increased from 2000 to the present and this is also because well, the increasing temperature initially causes also an increase of the availability of meltwater from snow cover and from glaciers but then as glaciers treat eventually meltwater also decreases and what we tried to do here was also to link the timing of these snow cover um, melt events to atmospheric circulation indices so that we could then uh, create a model that predicts the timing of these events to help the population manage them better. And finally, I would like to talk uh, a bit more about the Central Karakoram National Park. This is one of the most important uh, glacier areas of Pakistan, where 30% of the total glacier area is located. And we chose some of the largest glaciers of the planet outside of the poles. So we used the satellite data to create an inventory of glaciers of the Central Karakoram National Park. And uh, uh, so we found more than 600 glaciers here covering more than 3,700 square kilometers. And we also calculated the thickness of the debris cover on these glaciers, which uh, varies a lot between just from completely debris free glaciers to very small debris cover to debris covers up to more than three meters. And we also calculated the volume of ice, of total ice that is stored within these glaciers using a model. And this is more than 500 cubic kilometers, uh, most of which is actually uh, made up by the largest glaciers, uh, such as Baltor glaciers, which is the largest of the area. So what we have here is that there are, uh, there is a very large number of small glaciers which do not contribute a lot to the total volume. And then we have these huge glaciers, which really make up most of the total volume of ice in the central Karakoram National Park. And then we also estimated the meltwater that is produced by these glaciers over the course of 18 days. And this is more than 1.5 cubic kilometers. Now, again, to visualize this, you have to think that this is about 11% of the reservoir capacity of the Chambela Dam, which is located on the Indus River. So you can imagine how many people depend on the water from the Indus River, and so how, how much glaciers are important for the production of meltwater for Pakistan. And um, also the inventory of glaciers from the Central Karakoram National Park is available online. And, uh, and also uh, all of these information about meltwater uh, is also freely downloadable at the link here. And so I would like to conclude by also telling you uh, a bit about our next project, which is again in Pakistan, it's a project uh, founded by the United Nations Development Program. And in this project, we aim to map not just the glaciers of the Central Karakoram National Park, but all of Pakistani glaciers. And by comparison between the outlines of the glaciers um, from the past and those that we will create, we aim to then be able to understand the impacts that climate change is having on these glaciers in Pakistan. And we also have dedicated field campaigns uh, with which we aim to, to have an estimate of the production of meltwater in specific glaciers and also specific catchments of Pakistan and to install some automatic weather stations that will provide meteorological data which we will then share with the scientific community and the public. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation uh, which really uh, gives an idea of the risk uh, to which the, our glaciers, the glaciers everywhere in the world are exposed. And uh, unfortunately, we cannot do so much uh, uh, directly to block the, the, the decrease of ice, uh, but we have to consider the, the problem in a wider uh, dimension and uh, uh, inverting the climate change is uh, really a challenge, uh, but uh, 
uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to do it before all glaciers will disappear. Now, before passing to the second, uh, the second talk, uh, we have, we have the, uh, um, His Excellency Sergio Barbanti, the ambassador of Italy to Israel, who will give uh, a, a very short uh, uh, greetings to the participant to this uh, interesting uh, uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Good evening. Buonasera, perché voi siete italiani. Paola. Very pleased to be here. This is our first uh, event, so to say. Okay, we have to, to do it in this way since the beginning of the year on a topic which is very close to our interest, very close also to the experience of Israel especially as far as deserts are concerned. Many things have already been said, so I don't want to take any more uh, time on this. I just I wanted to be here personally and wish you all the best. And we are very keen and very eager, if you have any ideas of follow-up of this initiative, to let us know, because it's an important part of the cooperation uh, with the State of Israel. And uh, we will be very, very interested in in following it up uh, uh, in the future. Thank you very much. I'll give back the floor to Professor Ventura. Will say bye bye. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'm very pleased uh, to have received the greetings because it uh, underlined the commitment of the Italian Embassy. Uh, to support uh, action against the climate change uh, in Israel and in Italy and the coordination between Italy and Israel. Now it's time to pass back to, uh, to go back to, to scientific uh, talks and uh, it's now the time to listen to Pedro Berliner uh, uh, give a talk on ancient techniques for the solution of future problems. Just I uh, want to underline that we, we need absolutely to close the webinar uh, 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 at uh, at uh, five local times for in Italy because then we have another 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 meeting. Uh, so, Pedro, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the. Uh, Italian Embassy in Israel for asking me to uh, give my presentation, and it is a great pleasure. Uh, I must admit that the topics uh, were very different. The Alpine region in Italy and the desert in Israel, uh, I, I couldn't find many things in common when I started, when I was asked to give this talk. I, my first reaction was that the only thing in common is that if we were part of the Roman Empire 2000 years ago, which is not very relevant, but actually the title, which is so hard, so fragile, maybe is the common denominator for both areas. And uh, it maybe there's much more in common from this point of view than what I uh, would think just from the purely physiographic aspect. Uh, I will, I will, I try to start now this, is not responding. Ah, sorry. Okay. Uh, I will show first of all. This is a satellite uh, picture from uh, the area, uh, which was taken in late summer, and you can see the the green represents areas where there are where there is vegetation, and there is the rest is pretty devoid of any type uh, of uh, vegetation. Uh, Israel is, uh, I'm not sure if you see my arrow, Israel is situated somewhere in this area. It's so small, it doesn't really appear. Um, and uh, if we uh, move uh, to a slightly different scale, and this is the climate classification of Israel, the southern part of Israel, which is here a yellow, large, uh, light brown, is a warm desert. Uh, and uh, the red point, which is uh, you can see here, is corresponds to the site where I have been working for the last uh, tens of years. Uh, 
one of the characteristics of the desert is that there's very little rainfall. Um, and in this uh, graph, you can see the variation in the annual precipitation. Uh, we stopped at the 2000 because there was a, uh, problems with uh, our measurement station. It was renewed thereafter, but in order to uh, avoid any uh, uh, problems related to moving from one side to the other with meteorological data, I want just to show these uh, 40 years. And what, what is interesting is that there is an extremely large variability in the total rainial uh, annual rainfall. In average, it's very little, it's uh, 80 or 90 millimeters, but it can be as low as 30 millimeters or it can be much, much higher, like 180 millimeters. But by and large, and needless to say, this is a Mediterranean region, so all this precipitation is within three months of uh, during winter. And most of the year, there's no precipitation. And as I showed in my uh, first slide, it is very dry. It's therefore uh, pretty surprising to see suddenly on top of the, of the hill uh, remnants of what looks like old cities. Uh, in this case, this is Avdat, which was an old Nabataean city. The Nabataeans uh, more or less ruled the area from 300 before the common era to around 100 afterwards. And it is very surprising to see that in the middle of the desert, there was a city. How did they survive? Uh, the, ice, the rainfall is very low. There are no rivers in the zone. And uh, what it turns out that uh, archaeological uh, excavations and data indicated that these Nabataeans lived not only in the city of Ofdat in Israel, but were spread all over uh, this area of the Arabic Peninsula. Uh, it's a very interesting story, which I will not enter into how they came and how they, why they disappeared. But what is known is that they transported goods from the Arabian Peninsula to the Mediterranean. And as you saw from the first slide, this is a pretty, pretty dry area. And it is a big question. How could you get from one point from the uh, close to the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean? Uh, even though camels are the uh, ships of the desert, they cannot walk more than uh, two or three days without water. So there has to be some source of water. And uh, the source of water is related to floods in deserts. What you can see here, this is a small uh, uh, vadi. Vadi are usually dry riverbeds. Uh, immediately in the aftermath of a very small rainfall. It was a few uh, millimeters. And um, the, uh, the water in this case flows in a cascade and people come and have a look at it. What the Nabataeans did is that they used the contour of the land and you can see here some shrubs. And if we get closer to these shrubs, we can see a cistern. We can see the cistern because actually part of the roof fell in, but this cistern was full of water. Um, and this collected the run of the, the local floods into the cistern and the Nabataeans could thus move from point to point by um, having the water to drink for their animals. Uh, the uh, phenomena of a flood generation is related, obviously, to that of runoff generation. And uh, the runoff is a result of, the ex of two main factors. One is the presence of a crust on the soil, and the other is the rainfall intensity. If we look at the left-hand side of the picture, you can see this is a look at the soil from above. You are standing above a pub and looking at it. And what you can see is that an area you could here and there a small hole, but basically it is like a, not asphalt, but it is continuous cover. This does not allow a rapid penetration of water into the soil. The lower part, this is enhanced by the presence of um, algae and other uh, um, lichens, which 
give it an increase, a decrease even more the um, penetrability of water, the water infiltration. Uh, if we look what happens uh, when we've got a rainfall event, here we've got a small plot, and uh, you can see that the surface looks like uh, bright, reflecting the radiation. And this is actually water flowing on the surface. In this case, it flows to the uh, lowest part. And here we've got a system that measures the actual runoff. It's like a tipping bucket for uh, rainfall simulators. And the, all the water can be directed to flow into a pit. But it is also interesting to have a look at the uh, uh, rainfall patterns. Uh, rainfall patterns in desert are intermittent and patchy. Intermittent is what is shown here. You have some bursts of rainfall, and in between them, not much. The, the blue line here represents the precipitation, and the red line represents the runoff generation from a plot which is bare. Uh, and the green one represents what happens if you've got even a very little amount of vegetation uh, on the soil surface. But due to this very high precipitation um, intensities and the low infiltrability of the soil, most of the water gets uh, transforms into um, runoff. Uh, in some cases, this runoff uh, flows not into plots like I showed you previously, but flows into small uh, rivulets, into vadis, and from small vadis into large ones. And then you have this waterfalls I showed you previously. But uh, what the Nabataeans did, and this was partially at the results of the uh, presence of the Roman Empire that didn't allow them to move freely, they decide to use their skills in knowing how to collect this water to actually convey them to plots. And what you can see here, this is a reconstructed Nabataean uh, um, farm in which the, uh, the uh, flood water flows from left to the right. And on each, um, let's say, level, there are walls which retain the water. The water keeps on flowing uh, to lower and lower uh, high levels, and the water gets stored in these plots. Here you can see, incidentally, this is a pistachio crop. We had a flood, the water passed, uh, and we have here um, water standing to a depth of around 200, 250 millimeters. This is after a six millimeter rainfall, which obviously the six millimeters have no uh, importance uh, agriculturally, but the 250 millimeters, which we can store here, will allow the production of these trees and um, during the summer period. This is part of what the ancient technique I talk about. And now I would like to introduce a topic uh, which is very related to climate change, but I think um, has some very special um, connotations. And it is the desertification. And the desertification uh, has been uh, defined as uh, land degradation and drylands. Um, there are various factors, climate variation and human activities. Uh, this gives it a bit of very wide uh, definition and uh, climate variations are very, very important, but human activities as well, uh, as we unfortunately know. But um, in this sense, we need to uh, we need to uh, define land degradation. Uh, and again, this is a UN definition, which is a bit problematic because uh, reduction or loss of biological productivity is very clear. Economic productivity makes it a bit problematic because you may have an increase in price while you have a reduction in biological productivity. And therefore the income per unit area could still be high or increased and it would not be defined as desertification, even though obviously something is happening because there's a loss of biological or economic productivity. And last but not least, uh, drylands include all the regions where uh, basically we do not have a continuous uh, canopy cover throughout the year. And uh, desertification 
happens almost everywhere except in Antarctica. And uh, I would say that uh, also desertification does not happen in deserts. That's important to remember. This happens in an area on which there is some type of productivity. Uh, just to give you an idea of what drylands are, the drylands are what is painted here in uh, yellow and uh, all the various, uh, the importance of the drylands appears clearly in the bottom. I will not go through each of them, but drylands are extremely important to livelihood on our planet. And these precisely on these areas is where we can have desertification and it, which can have catastrophic uh, consequences. There are millions and millions of people uh, affected by desertification. And in this context, I would say, that it is important to re remember that uh, even though desertification may happen in the United States of America and it may happen in Africa, obviously the problem people in Africa face are different than people in the United States. Uh, the lack of uh, infrastructure, the lack of capital make it much more serious in areas like Africa. And essentially I would say the Convention for Combating Desertification is aimed mainly in trying to uh, alleviate problems of desertification in third world countries. Uh, I would uh, like to introduce another topic which is related to desertification, and is the fact that the very large parts of the population uh, uses firewood for cooking and heating. We see on the top uh, women carrying uh, firewood on her head, this is a uh, very classic of anybody who traveled in Africa and the gentleman behind her is carrying some sort of wood stick as well. And in the roadside, this is in the province of Angola and Namib, uh, when you drive along, you can see people selling firewood and selling charcoal. This is a very uh, important uh, issue for inhabitants in the area. Now, the fuel prices uh, is a, very, very important. We, it was very important during, it was in a sense a bit forgotten with the emphasis on climate change. But as you can see in some areas of the world, like in Sub-Saharan Africa and India, 70% of population is using on biomass for cooking. But this is a lot, this is incredibly, there are very high uh, proportion of people using firewood and very large volumes of firewood are used. Uh, sorry, biomass. And in this slide, what we can see that basically the main source is fuel. And fuel comes from trees. And uh, trees, uh, when you collect the dry wood, which you see in forests, is no problem. That's fine. You even can alleviate the explanation of uh, fires. But when you start cutting trees, uh, which is what happens in most of uh, areas in Africa, uh, what the, the trees are not there to protect the soil from the impact of dry uh, raindrops. And this leads to the uh, breakdown of aggregates on the surface, cross runoff. The result is that when you cut trees in these areas, in drylands, there's a very good chance that they will not grow back again. And so, the use of firewoods increases the desertification, which already is uh, accelerated by climate change. So, what we thought that, uh, bearing in mind uh, that, ah, sorry, I forgot uh, this uh, slide. This just gives us a, a um, idea of how important this is in Africa. This is a very uh, old, as you can see, the FAO is from 1982. I didn't find anything new that has been done recently. This is because this is a very hard work and um, it takes a long time. You need ground truth. It's not enough to do it with uh, image satellite, with satellites, uh, images from satellites. And nobody produced, as far as I know, a new uh, fuel crisis. But this just shows the importance of the fuel crisis. Now, coming back to the um, our Negev uh, and the old techniques, uh, you can see here that uh, we have here a dry river uh, body in the middle and on the sides of it 
we've got uh, these uh, mountains, uh, these hills, sorry, not mountains. And what we uh, develop is a system which we call a runoff agroforestry. It is based on the idea of collecting runoff. Now, the precipitation which will falls on the slopes will be transformed quite a large fraction of it on runoff. This runoff flows into the low, low lying areas, and this low lying areas, if we surround them with the wall, would catch the water, as I showed you in previous slides. The water can then penetrate deep into the soil. We are talking about, as I said, uh, easily two meters. Uh, if we, if our walls, for example, collect around 400 uh, millimeters, we can wet up to two meters. If we've got the good fortune that we've got two runoff events, we can store water to three or four meters depth. And therefore, we can plant trees, and, plant, and trees will grow pretty well because we've got a large uh, volume of soil from which to take up water. We thought that it would be also interesting to plant a crop in between the rows of trees and thereby increase the efficiency by which uh, water is used because they would explore basically a different um, soil depth than the roots of the trees, as you can see here. Uh, systematically, uh, schematically, what we decided, we decided to use a tree, which is, a, in this case, acacia. This is a nitrogen-fixing shrub, actually, it's a shrub tree. And to plant in between the rows of the tree, something which we can use for grain of fodder. And this system will produce, if we cut the, um, the branches and, the, and the, the branches, the branches can be used as firewood and the leaves can be used to uh, as fodder to feed sheep or goats. Uh, we tried this, I must admit that the sheep and goat didn't like it very much, but uh, when there was nothing else to eat, which is something which happened very frequently in desert, they had some green uh, fodder to eat. Uh, we, uh, ah, here you can see uh, uh, one of my students, this is a student from Gambia, uh, once the uh, uh, plots are full of water, uh, you uh, can wade through the plots, actually. Uh, the arch, he was a very small fellow, but still uh, we had around 500, um, cent, uh, um, 500 millimeters of water stored in one flood. In this case, our uh, walls were designed to do it, and the trees you see in the foreground are the acacia trees. Uh, what we do is the following. We lop completely the trees, which means we leave basically the main branches, there are no leaves, and in between the rows, we plant the crop we are uh, interested in. Uh, and uh, after some time, in this case, this is acacia with sorghum, uh, the intercrop grows, and because it starts growing when there are no leaves on the trees, it actually is growing without competition. Once the trees start uh, developing, they start shading and decreasing the amount of radiation that reach the crop. But if this is timed properly, the uh, reproductive phase of the uh, intercrop is already there, and actually shade will help the crop to develop better. Uh, we tasted, uh, tested the system in uh, Kenya in the uh, Turkana Desert, which is known as a very harsh, uh, harsh desert. And the results were quite uh, interesting. And I will show them in this uh, diagram in which we look at the production of the biomass production of the intercrop on the y axis and the production of the trees on the x axis. And uh, the stippled line uh, joins the uh, points, the points of maximum uh, tree production and maximum of uh, intercrop production. And what we assume is that any points, any point that lies on the step line, we have got no real advantage. If we move up here, we produce less trees, 
but uh, we uh, have a given amount of uh, sorghum. We move further up, we increase the production of sorghum, but decrease the production of trees. So it was very uh, interesting and very, uh, uh, which actually uh, showed that our hypothesis was correct, that when we looked at the uh, tree, at the uh, treatments which were intercropped, were pruned, and irrespective of density, we tested two uh, tree densities, we produce more than we would produce by cultivating each of them separately. This I find is extremely interesting and it makes that this system has a very great potential. The reason is why does this happen? And this happens basically because we have a less evaporation of water from the soil. When we plant the trees on their own, the area in between the trees is basically exposed. And after the flood, most of this water evaporates without being used by any crop. When we've got an intercrop, during the period of time where the trees have no leaves, they use the water that would otherwise evaporate into the atmosphere. And thus our gross water use efficiency, meaning the biomass for total stored water increases dramatically. We also, uh, there is also later less competition for radiation because if we plant the intercrop without pruning the trees, no radiation would reach the, or very little radiation would reach the intercrop and limit its development. So the fact that we lock the trees and plant them allows us to produce more again than what we do for each, uh, uh, each component on their own. Uh, but we thought that uh, on the long run, this would be a problem because if we've got an intercrop, the intercrop would inevitably take up part of the nutrients in the soil. So uh, we decided to improve our system and use the leaf. Remember that this is a legume tree, so it absorbed nitrogen uh, through the uh, root system from the association, symbiotic association with uh, bacteria. And we therefore used the leaves, part of them, and composted them, added them as organic nitrogen to the soil, and then planted the intercrop. Uh, these trees are called multipurpose fast growing trees. Again, this acacia saligna grows very fast, but its main feature in this case is that it fixes nitrogen. The results were, again, very uh, surprising, not very surprising, very encouraging. Here you can see in the foreground, you can see the tree which is beginning to produce some leaves while the intercrop is already growing. In the background, the trees that were not locked. What you can see here are also white caps. These caps are uh, beneath these caps, we have got flex, uh, transparent uh, tubes uh, through which we can uh, um, lay. Uh, let down a small uh, cameras that take pictures of the rooting system and then allow us to describe the development of the root system with time. When we look at the results, and I'm looking mainly at the upper graph, uh, we see here that the situation which is uh, even better than what I showed in the previous graph, if we look at the yellow with the blue and the red with the black, which are both are the um, the red is the red with the black is the prune trees plus maize and compost and the uh, yellow with the blue is the prune trees and maize you can see first of all the effect the uh, compost had on increasing the productivity which is not surprising but still it is very very significant and what is interesting here that in this case is uh, opposed to what we had in the previous case, because the maize is a very quickly growing crop uh, during the first stages, uh, the presence of the intercrop did not affect the productivity of the trees. There was no reduction in the tree production due to the presence of the intercrop. Um, there, this was a result of the fact that the roots of the trees, which we can see here, at the bottom, this is the, uh, the root length of the tree end of the maize was higher than when you've got only trees or only maize. And we also managed to 
uh, see that what happened was that we had more roots from the trees deeper in the profile, meaning that they took up water from layers which under normal circumstances, they wouldn't have taken up water. So this system in which we had the uh, compost not only increases the actual productivity of the system, but is at well um, ensures the sustainability of the system. Because if we would not add nutrients, after some time, the productivity of the intercrop would decrease. And in this case, we are actually adding a natural fertilizer without having to introduce a very expensive nitrogen fertilizer. We would be not available for most of people in the African drylands. I would therefore uh, like to round up and look at the advantage of this system which we have developed. First of all, it's very low cost. Basically, what you have to do is you have to find the area which you can collect the runoff and where you can um, make uh, walls, uh, which you can do by hand. We in Tulkana area did it by hand. You can do it by machinery, but uh, it's simple to do. It is a distributed system, which means that uh, if you have a very large number of these plots in different valleys, um, if there is a problem in one of them, this does not affect the rest. You have got no one cent a central conveying system which will make break down and bring catastrophe. Very easy to implement. The maintenance costs are minimum. You just have to make sure that there are there are no holes in your walls. It's flexible, and obviously, needless to say, it is a minimum of pollution rate. Uh, we simultaneously can produce firewood, fodder, and grains, and the composting uh, of the leaves. Uh, not only increased the biomass production of the intercrops, uh, it also increased the gross water use efficiency of the system. And as I mentioned, uh, the compost ensures that the system is sustainable. However, there are some caveats. Uh, one of the important things is that the soil has to have the appropriate water holding capacity. Uh, this would not work in a sandy soil, for example. This is something we should be. You know, the soil has to be deep enough as well to allow the vertical differentiation of rooting systems, meaning that if I have, a, for example, a soil which is a 50 centimeters deep or even one met meter deep, there would be competition between the two species and the system would have no advantage of having each of the crop uh, separately. And the second one is, and third one is, that uh, we have to wet, even if you've got a very uh, deep soil, we have to be able to wet it well beneath the depth of the roots of the intercrop. Otherwise, again, there will be competition for water. All in all, I think that what we can say is that in view of the fact that at least in arid regions and the surrounding in the Mediterranean, what we see is that as a result of climate change, we appear to have an increase in the uh, events of uh, high rainfall intensity and maybe therefore of runoff events, this system could potentially provide more water and firewood than what we would have before climate change. So there, I wouldn't say that uh, it completely contrasts the effect of climate change, but at least gives us a glimmer of hope that we can uh, use some of these changes uh, to our advantage. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, I have to say that apparently it, it's much easier to contrast the effects of uh, negative effects of climate uh, change uh, on a small scale in uh, in uh, drylands and in des uh, deserts or uh, arid zones than blocking the melting of glaciers uh, and the uh, uh, reduction of uh, the snow coverage. Um, but in any case, I think that we have uh, some uh, also some uh, uh, we, we need to take a special care of our uh, mountain regions, our glaciers. Uh, 
and the periglacious areas uh, and uh, surely we, we could uh, uh, modify a little bit uh, the social um, uh, um, social life uh, around uh, our mountains uh, our glaciers to to try to decrease the negative effects but now we we want to uh, listen to uh, the last uh, talks uh, for today uh, uh, Paola Gigliotti will give us a, a, a more in deep uh, uh, glimpse in what what happens to the population living in in, the, in this uh, fragile area, especially the mountains, uh, and uh, uh, how we can consider what is happening uh, either from an anthropocentric view or from a biocentric uh, point of view. So please, uh, uh, please, uh, um, Paola, the floor is yours. Lose uh, the connection. Okay, it's okay. 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 Uh, good evening to all, and thank you uh, to the other speakers. Thank you to the Ambasciata Italiana in Israel and the Istituto Italiano di Cultura. Thank you, Stefano Ventura. This is uh, very nice to meet you by telephone. <laughs> And uh, thank you to Sergio Barbanti, the ambassador Italiano in Israel. Uh, I, I live in Austria, in, on the border from Austria and Italy in Dolomites. And uh, I work here as a medicine doctor in two hospitals, two mountains hospitals, uh, Brunico and San Candido. So I live real the, the life of mountaineers. And, uh, uh, the other part of the of my time is in Perugia, uh, where I I work in a university, and uh, I am a professor of uh, env environmental sport in the University of Medicine of Perugia. This is my presentation, but I am a mountaineer. And uh, uh, now I want to try to um, to share with you my thoughts about uh, the about uh, the relationship between man and the nature, and uh, also my life experience. My PowerPoint is only to see uh, very nice photos and uh, not uh, my <laughs> my face very signed uh, by two, uh, two years of pandemic work in a critical area. Thank you. The PowerPoint, please. Okay. Anthropocentric or biocentric? I came at a certain point in my life and, and suddenly I realized that I had experienced historical changes and I was lucky not to be an outside spectator, but to have been in them with the, all the difficulties, but also the benefits that this entails. I have crossed the, the Berlin Wall, shared the difficulties of friends who were on the other side of the various borders of the world. I have seen many of them fall. I have dreamed of Europe and seen it come true. I have fought and helped many lasts and I have seen many others born. However, the change that is most evident to me today is the relationship between mankind and the environment. In the medical profession, we have studied, I speak in plural, uh, because everything has been done with my husband, Francesco Coscia, and the careful supervision of the great teacher, Giorgio Fano Illich, the damage of the sedentaries on our health. But 
Moving on, our focus has been the movement in the natural environment and the importance on the, of finding a feeling between man and the nature. Example, uh, what is the impact on the five senses when, when the children live only in, the children, but also the adult, uh, live only in the urban um, environment. Uh, fully convinced of this and looked at the, as the usual alternatives, we were followed, however, in our conferences since 1993 with, with Jimmy's on, in the Sun, uh, 1998 Human Rights and Environmental Rights, and then uh, invited to speak uh, about it in international context. Uh, final, uh, finally, and most by surprise, I feel that the defense of the earth is no longer relegated to the conferences of green clubs, but becomes the main point of political agendas and the most prestigious uh, scientific meetings. At the same time, many people are realizing that the environment in which we live has a great impact on health and they require medical explanations and effective remedies. The same alternatives we, we can finally able to implement the sport wellness environment project. What has happened? Climate changes had, has become evident to all, to all the, the, the population, not only to the scientific or the, the green population. All the population can see the evident climate change. The COVID-19 pandemic confronted, confronted men with its big, biggest fragility, and this despite the high level of medical science, the plague, the Spanish flu, and the poliomyelitis only seemed like history. Instead, a pandemic uh, arrives as an invincible paralysis of the world. I am living it as a, a medic, but I am observing it as a, an animal of nature. Man is still, but the rest of nature goes, and two winters, two springs, two summers pass, and then autumn again. The earth seems to breathe better with the, uh, a mankind still, and the mankind feels the need to find again the lost feeling with the nature. Are we at, the, at a point of no return? I do not think so. I think we are at a crossroad on one side, anthropocentrism, and on the other side, biocentrism, the usual dilemma. The right way is not a choice between the two, but the defense of a bios. There is only one life that must necessarily include mankind and the nature, bringing them back to a harmonious coexistence wherever this life is, from highlands to desert, is the same. One needs the wellness of the other. I'm copying this next point from my son's work, The Mountain in the Greek Tragedy. The Greek concept of Oros, which designates as a mountain a place that is not necessarily high, but something external to the policy activity a place rich in divinities, symbolism, a place of the spirit. If a man finds this, these places again, it will definitely defend them and have a healthy physiological relationship with the environment. This year, 
I was uh, for the first time a member of a jury of a Premio Mazzotti. This is a literary prize from 40 years as the environment as main focus. The Mediterranean and the Middle East Mountains had great relevance in this edition. And the first prize, La Montagna Calabrese, is a demonstration of this new attention. I am pleased uh, to continue these this reflections with a very nice announcement. 2022 has been proclaimed by the United Nations as the International Year of Sustainable Mountain Development. I have been a member of the FAO Mountain Partnership uh, since 2002, the International Mountain Year. I feel, uh, I feel like the addition of the, these two words, sustainable development. It is for me uh, a sign of the work done in 20 years. Uh, uh, my, uh, my, um, with the FAO, we, um, this, uh, we focus our work on nutrition of a population. And this is very important because the population of, of high mountains had serious problems when they started to eat something from the other, uh, the other parts of the world allergy or no good uh, nutrition are the main consequence. I had a fantastic experience with the Nandi India Foundation to help uh, women and girls to have a correct nutrition. Uh, the same thing is the migration from the desert in consequence of climate changes and the difficulty of nutri nutrition. On July 9, we had a meeting with the FAO focused on agriculture and the nutrition problems in Nepal, Malawi, and the little farms of Argentina. The climate changes and the now COVID-19 make this situation dramatic, very dramatic. Uh, so my work is to help uh, the the men to live in a good equilibrium with, with themselves and the nature. And this is a continuous working in progress because we have from one side the climate changes and the other side the, the life that is completely different after COVID-19. Uh, anthropocentric or biocentric. Uh, I say stay in the middle and look around. Uh, as, uh, as we can see in this uh, wonderful drawing of the Italian Nobel Prize Dario Fo, and uh, you can uh, discover uh, many secrets to, to, live, uh, to live better. Uh, as in this other drawing of another uh, Italian artist, Silvana Migliorati. Uh, I hope that I can, uh, uh, I, I hope that I give, can give you a, a good, a good example to, to, to live in a good relationship with the nature and to, to, to try to have another relationship with the, the environment and another relationship with the, all our life because our health is connected with the health of environment and our mental health and our physical health is in direct connection. 
I hope in the next webinar uh, to show how we can study the fitness profile of, of uh, any person, every, any man, uh, to give uh, to everyone the opportunity to, to, to live in, uh, in, 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 excuse me, is the nature i have a dog <laughs> and, and, and the, the dog uh, can to stay in a good webinar but excuse me and uh, i i we we try to give it to everyone the possibility to study the fitness profile and to give the opportunity uh, to live the the the, 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 the and the, to enjoy the environment the mountain the sea the the hills uh, in accord with uh, phys with the own physical performance this is uh, my message thank you thank you paola for this wide uh, wider view on uh, on the relationships between uh, 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 mountains and fragile uh, habitats uh, with the uh, with the uh, human population, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, close this uh, this appointment of today um, uh, with a, a, a few uh, underlines uh, that I, I really took from from all uh, the three contributions. Um, my, my my consideration is that sustainable de development can be the can be the active societal approach uh, to the reduction of negative effects of climate change in, in fragile areas like high mountains with glaciers uh, and arid and desert areas. So sustainable development means that we have to reach uh, a, a balance within the human presence uh, and the needs of the environment. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, avoid to be present in, in a fragile area but we have to respect the integrity of the of the environment. First of all, I think that uh, what was clear from all three uh, contributions is that we absolutely need uh, to decrease or eliminate pollution. Pollution is a, is, is a damage everywhere, but in, in fragile areas like deserts, uh, like, uh, like uh, um, uh, glaciers, uh, has a, a strongly negative impact. Uh, impact on the surface of the glaciers, uh, impact of the runoff, uh, in, impact of the waters, uh, water. Uh, uh, and uh, um, if we go in, into the micro uh, scale, uh, if you look to the uh, microplastic, then we can find microplastic everywhere and they are spreading and diffusing and moving from one place to the another. So it's a global problem to reduce microplastic that uh stay in in uh, in in the, in the on the glaciers will will be diffused spread uh through the water flow everywhere and for the, uh, at the same time uh, microplastic in, in desert areas uh, will be moved and diffused by wind uh, and uh, will end up to uh, uh enter the uh, food chain that is dangerous for men and for animals and for all living beings so we need to decrease pollution we 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 need to 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 shift to a sustainable use of resources because these uh, environments uh, are uh, relatively poor of resources they don't have so many resources so we we cannot uh, uh, destroy the, the environment to uh, make use of ex excessive use of the resources so it means that we have to protect the integrity of the environment to avoid, to increase, to multiply the effects of the climate change. And uh, last but not least, I, I know that this last statement is not, is not nice to, to hear, but we have to not to overload fragile areas with excess human presence. Fragile areas cannot uh, be the, uh, the place for too many people to all together. So when I think what happens uh, um, on the Mount our mountains it, during the ski season, I see that uh, there's too many people, too many people on the on the on the on the snow, and too many people uh, in in the villages, uh, too many people 
producing sewage and uh, consuming and uh, uh, they need uh, house heating. So this is not uh, uh, sustainable. And at the same time in the desert, we cannot keep too many people living in the desert. Just a, a small example that comes from my, my research activity. Um, uh, Pedro talked about uh, uh, biocrusts. Biocrusts are very important uh, uh, for the for the uh, the life of the desert because they reduce uh, uh, erosion, they stabilize the soil, and produce nutrients for the for the soil and uh, allow the the arrival of uh, higher plants. So if we tramp over 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 the crusts, if we go with uh, cars. Uh, uh, and we walk uh, and we, we have too many uh, animals going there, then we destroy the crusts uh, and the, when the winds, the wind come, comes, they, uh, it sweeps all the, all, the, all, the, all the surface of the soil, making a big damage. So everywhere we have to remember that uh, human presence is important, but also the number of persons living in a, in a given area uh, depends uh, from the resources and the structure of the, 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 the place where we live. Other way, we, in, in few, in, in a short time, we won't be able to live there in any, in any, anyone. So, uh, thank you very much again for your contribution. I think that uh, I, I would have liked to, to have you in person here in, in Israel next time uh, or in, 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 in the next future, I hope it will be again possible to meet in real person and uh, to uh, fight together for the uh, preservation of the environment uh, and to reduce the negative effects of uh, uh, climate change. So, thank you very much. And uh, I remember that in one week we'll have a new a new webinar uh, connected to the human presence and human activities in. Uh, uh, fragile areas in mountain areas in desert areas very interesting also looking to what what the uh, what we can do there what what we can grow there and how to do that in a, a sustainable way so thank you very much and goodbye and have a, a nice evening thank you good evening good evening